Hey y'all, this is Lizzie Scully, co-owner of Four Corners Guides and co-author of the Bike Raft Guide with Steve Fastbinder, aka Doom. We run a multi-sport adventure guide service out of Mancus, Colorado. So we're not going to get all fancy with this podcast. We're just going to record some learn to pack raft and learn to bike raft Q and A's with our guides and other experts in the industry. And we'll throw in some fun adventure storytelling and maybe even some fireside chats that we capture out in the field or at Skullbinder Ranch. It's a catch all podcast. So if you have questions, comments, or suggestions, feel free to make them in the comments or ping us at fourcornersguides at gmail.com. In our second episode of A Beginner's Guide to Packrafting podcast, we're chatting with Tony Miley, owner of Four Corners River Sports, a large and long running whitewater boat shop in Durango, Colorado. In this episode, Tony talks about some of the highest quality pack rafting gear for people aspiring to be whitewater boaters. Four Corners does not sell all the available whitewater boats or equipment, such as Cocopelli rafts or any of the numerous whitewater paddles out there in the world. But this Q&A and overview will give you a great place to start if you're exploring opportunities to go whitewater boating. How's it going? My name's Tony. I'm uh, one of the owners here at Four Corners River Sports. I have been here since 1999. The store's been here since 1983. And we specialize in kind of whitewater, river rafting, kayaking, pack rafting, paddle boarding, kind of all that good stuff. Pack rafting community over the last few years has grown dramatically. We have so many unique rivers in this area flowing through the desert southwest that offer great multi-day opportunities, single-day trips, lots of good rivers that are hard to access you know, by other means, carrying your boat in is really kind of the only option in some of the cases. People have been doing bikepacking trips and climbing trips and all kinds of stuff where they've added on to it's not just boating anymore. You've got like a whole other way to, to a whole other group of things to go do out there. And pack rafts really offer a unique way to carry gear like that. I mentioned earlier we kind of focused on selling whitewater oriented pack rafts mainly the Wolverine, the Valkyrie, and the Narwhal. All of them have the ability to be a skirted boat or open as a self baler In this area, we find we have warm weather, really cold water in a lot of cases. The skirted boats tend to do a little better for us. We've been, I've seen pack rafts down in Costa Rica where the self baler made absolute 100% better sense. People could jump in and out of it more easily. The water's 70 degrees, and you don't need to be sealed in there to stay warm. This, the skirts really, we find, help in this area. With the cold water keeping you from constantly being on you. Gear-wise, a few essentials that you want to have every time you go out. Obviously, your paddle is going to be one of your first and most important things. It's your connection to the water. They kind of run the gamut. You can spend as much or as little as you want on a paddle. What you're getting for when you spend more money tends to be you're going with a carbon fiber fiberglass paddle that is significantly lighter than something that's going to be, you know, uh, more of a basic starter paddle. This is going to be an inject fiberglass shaft, but an injection molded blades, kind of like a carbon injection molded plastic. It's not going to be as stiff. It's going to be heavier. You know, durability wise, these are a great way to start out. They can take a ton of abuse. You know, in the long run, most people, you know, your first paddle is certainly not going to be your last. And paddles are one thing you upgrade. Like I said, it's your connection to the water and having that nice light feel in your hands. It's a really important part of, of, of the experience. And then as you do longer and longer trips, you know, say a 10, 15 day Grand Canyon trip, 275 miles. Every ounce, you'll feel it after paddling that far. You know, a nice paddle goes a long way. The other thing to look for with paddles is a lot of pack rafts, a lot of times for pack rafting, you want a paddle that breaks down into, you know, small pieces if you're gonna be doing a lot of hiking with it. This, you know, is great for packing if you're that's not your main focus. 
If your main focus is more river running, you can get a two-piece and get this one-piece solid paddle. They tend to be a little lighter because you lose the joints. All these joints, you know, that's going to be your weak spot in any paddle. So the more joints you have, oh, you can have a little bit of play or, or a potential weak spot. If you're not using them to pack in and out a lot of places, you know, consider maybe a two-piece or a one-piece paddle. You are packing them around a lot. You know, four piece is kind of the best way to go. So these are all going to be kind of geared towards general river running. Aquabound makes this one. This is called the Shred. It's your injection molded blade, kind of more starter paddle. And then this is called the Whiskey. This is probably the lightest whitewater pack wrap paddle that we carry. I would say maybe if you're running a lot of shallow, rocky rivers and stuff, this isn't going to be your best choice. Bigger volume, deep water, flat water, this is a great choice. Being lighter, it isn't going to be quite as durable. And then kind of falling right in between those two, you have something like your Werner Sherpa here. And this comes in one piece, two piece, four piece, straight shaft, bench shaft. You've got a lot of options here. This is a really, really heavy duty, white water, solid fiberglass blade. It's also available in full carbon. If you want to really get crazy and spend some money. But these are incredibly durable. This is, you know, if you're running small, narrow creeks, lots of rocks, this is going to take that abuse. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind is where am I going to be going? What am I going to be doing? And uh, that's something, you know, everybody kind of has to answer for themselves as you're figuring out what you want to do. Next, and not necessarily probably the most important piece of equipment that you're going to have are your PFDs. And what you want to look for here in a life jacket or PFD is going to be comfort. You are spending all day in this and everybody's body is shaped a little different. There's a lot of adjustability on all these life jackets. I highly recommend trying on several. Everybody's body shape's different. Everybody's it's going to fit differently on everyone. And the other thing to consider is how your pack wrap is set up. You've got a back band in there. And it's gonna hit kind of right in here. You wanna make sure that's not interfering with the back piece of your PFD. Some life jackets offer like a thinner material on the back side, and that's something you know to consider if you're running into that back band hitting in a weird spot for you. And this is the Stolquist Rocker. This is one of our most popular life jackets. It's nice, low profile, very open in the shoulders. When you're taking paddle strokes, it really does not interfere, moves well with you. Good clamshell pockets, and basic stuff there. This is a good type three, it's considered. Um, this will get you everywhere from the Grand Canyon, Westwater, Dolores, whatever you want to do. This is going to meet all ranger improvements. You want to make sure um, that you are U.S. Coast Guard certified on any life jacket you have, should have a U.S. Coast Guard cert on there. If you are been in the game for a while, there's some other options out there. This is a Type 5 Rescue PFD. Offers a full sewn-in harness. You've got a belay loop built into this thing down here. A few extra different pockets. You've got a quick release safety belt to tie into a like a tow harness into. If someone swims, you can clip onto their boat, get it to shore. If you need to do live bait rescues, this is where this is gonna be. This is the green jacket from Astral, the limited edition one, where the wild things are. Kind of fun print on this thing. But this is kind of one of our best-selling Type 5 PFDs. Not necessary if you don't have the training or the skills to perform swift water rescue. This is overkill and more likely to get yourself into trouble trying to use some of these features. But for, for someone who's had swift water rescue training, this is kind of going to be your your go-to safety jacket. Again, that's the Stolquest Rocker, Astral Green Jacket. Those are just a couple examples. Coke Tap makes some great PFDs as well. So one thing you do want to stay away from in a whitewater situation is any kind of inflatable PFD. People see these in our store. We do carry them. You know, lake fishermen, paddle boarding on the lakes, that kind of thing. This is perfectly acceptable for lake use. In a whitewater situation, this is, one, it's not going to get you through any river ranger station ever. But this is not designed to instantly inflate when it hits the water. This has a pull cord. There's a lot that could happen to you between the time that 
tip over and if you're even conscious to pull the cord, you know, this is not going to save you. Do not, I do not recommend ever using this in any kind of white water situation. Next item, helmets are something that we really recommend people use. You'll see people out there without them. PFD, it's called a life jacket. Buy a new one, buy a good one, don't buy it used. Next most important thing from your life, we're gonna go with your head. And if you have a helmet here is pretty important. Finding one that fits well and it's comfortable. Because again, much like your life jacket, you're gonna be in this thing all day long in a lot of cases. My favorites are the Sweet brand helmets. They've got a couple different models. This one's called the Strutter. Pack rafting and anything that is not scaring me. This is kind of my go-to helmet. I love having a little baseball brim. Out here in the desert, we get all kinds of sun. It cuts cut down on that reflection. It keeps the sun out of your, off your face. It's not quite as burnt at the end of the day. And they have this great little adjustment here in the back. Like, that's not even strapped on, staying on. You want something snug, but not uncomfortable in, in that. If you're running something more difficult or just want that added protection or added warmth, um, springtime is cold, really cold water, often cold temperatures. Sweet Wanderer, it's a little better coverage, comes down further in the back, more on the sides. There are also removable ear pads to kind of keep your head warmer. These are a great. Class four or five helmet, you know, anything that's scaring you, if you want that extra protection, want that warmth, this is a great choice. Price-wise, it's also a really good value, I think. It's one of my best values. It's 130 bucks. Carbon, injection molded carbon into this thing. It's stiff, but not so much that your head's banging around in there. So those are a couple of my favorite helmets. Again, comfort is key, because you're gonna be in this thing all day. Moving on, footwear. Let's talk shoes. Couple of my favorites, Astrals, I've got them on. I wear them street shoes. When they get too stinky here, they move into my river bag. And it's a continuous cycle for the last 10 years. This is the Brewer, and Brewis is the ladies' version. Super sticky rubber sole. This is a low top. A lot of people like the, it's called the Wrestler. A little higher top does protect that ankle bone, which is really important if you're portaging, scouting, you know, scrambling around on rocks, or hiking in or out of somewhere for that matter. The high top is definitely kind of a nice option. This is another shoe by Rocky, it's called. Nice, really firm sole, lightweight upper, drains really well. Uh, this shoe does really good longer hikes and that kind of thing. Still a fan of Astro, but I think that is also a good choice. Moving on, let's take a look at dry wear and wetsuits. We've talked about that kind of difference here for a second. So I don't really recommend wetsuits to a lot of folks. If you're on a budget, you need to stay warm, you're gonna get out there one way or another, you can find wetsuits pretty inexpensive. They will keep you warm. They're kind of clammy, you're wet, and they're not super comfortable because they're real tight on you, even when they're kind of broken and fit correctly. I really try to push people towards buying a dry suit. It's Basically, you're wearing a full Gore-Tex ski suit that doesn't allow water in. A uh, couple of my favorites. This is the Kokatat Icon. This is going to be a back zip dry suit. Back opens up, climb in through there. You've got Gore-Tex socks built into this. And kind of one size. You're gonna get a little bundling in there, but it's not too bad. This is the men's version with a relief zip in the front. There's a women's version with a drop seat because there's nothing like having an emergency and having to get out of your dry suit in a hurry. No fun. The other thing to look for in a dry suit, if you are using a skirted boat, this is, has a double tunnel. So your spray skirt comes on, pulls up over this, and then this comes down over your spray skirt. It really helps keep water sealed out of the boat. You're still going to get a little through there. There's no avoiding that, but double tunneled dry suit is definitely a good way to go for skirted boats. Similar to like a hard shell kayak would have, you know, it's going to just double up a seal there. If you're not using a skirt, a skirted boat, there's not necessarily a reason to have this, but it won't get in the way. 
I generally recommend to folks to, to get one with a double tunnel in case you ever do decide to go with something with a skirted, whether it's a hard shell or a, a skirted um, pack raft. Again, that's the Coke Tat Icon. Now the next one is the NRS Axiom. This is a front zip, so it's a little easier if you're doing solo trips. The back zip's great, but you kind of have to have a buddy. You can do it by yourself, but you need to put a strap through that zipper and doing some funky yoga to get it on and off. Front zip dry suit here, comes diagonally across the front here. Still has that nice double tunnel. This is the full, uh, these boats to these suits are very full of Gore-Tex Pro Shell. You know, highly breathable and just some of the best material out there. One thing I'd like to mention with dry suits and any kind of technical gear like that in particular, you're purchasing a Gore-Tex suit. Gore-Tex is designed to be highly breathable. A lot of people will put on underneath these layers like a, some sort of neoprene or non-breathable type layer. It's defeating the purpose of the Gore-Tex. So always make sure you're wearing something like a Merlino or a poly fleece kind of material that's gonna breathe and allow moisture to escape out of there. But don't put on like a Hydra skin or some other kind of thin neoprene layer that's not gonna breathe. It'll just clam up inside there and you'll be less comfortable. And they make some really nice union suits, one piece zipper suits from both Coquette, NRS, Immersion Research all make really nice ones. A couple other little odds and ends, you know, things to take along in your boat and things to not do. Let's talk carabiners for a second. What we've got here is three different types, two locking, one's a screw lock, one's a twist lock. And one here is a non-locking beaner. We get a lot of questions. People show up with a non-locking carabiner and they'll put it right here on their life jacket. And then they'll get in their boat. And you can see in there, you got your thigh straps, you got a back band strap. And what can happen if you have your non-locking beaner and you're sitting in there, this can, you're pushing around, it can clip through one of those straps or rope or anything. You know, there's nothing stopping it from just getting pushed in and open. And now all of a sudden you are permanently attached to your boat. You can't reach back there. You don't know how or why it's happening. But non-locking beaners are a safety hazard out on the river. Something to keep in mind. You should never have one of these clipped anywhere inside on your boat, your person. They're good around camp maybe for hanging stuff. I don't know. Dry line, that is the best place I can think of to have one on the river, and I really wouldn't recommend even bothering care them. Just make them all locking and make sure you actually close the lock. Because without closing it like a screw lock like that, you are in the same position as if it was a non-locking beaner. But you know, once that beaner's locked up, you carry it in the boat, you carry it on your stuff, and you're not gonna have that safety hazard of potentially getting clipped into something you don't want to be attached to. Screw locks are good. These are almost even better. You know, this is just a twist lock and push and twist. And that pops open and it automatically locks. You can't mess this up. That's probably the safest way to go if you're unfamiliar with kind of dealing with carabiners on a regular basis. Other important safety, a little Fox 40 whistle. $7 piece of equipment can save people's lives. There's a lot of different ideas out there. One blast, two blasts, three blasts, and just make sure you and your team kind of communicate and know like what to expect when you hear whistles going. That's another piece of safety equipment. These are designed to attach to life jackets. This would be like a pocket one. Both of these have little inside pockets designed to hold a knife. A couple companies are pushing for folders as opposed to a fixed blade knife on the outside. I tend to lean towards the fixed blade, but I've been paddling a long time, so I'm biased perhaps. But fixed blade knife, you do get throw bag tangled up in something, or your friend is tangled up in something. We've had people get caught up on their spray skirts on logs and things like that, where you need to cut that loose. If they've swum into, swam into a strainer or something along those lines, it's good to have a, a blade of some sort out there with you and, and easily accessible. Don't put it in your dry bag in the back of the boat. That should be in in the front pocket or along this little knife tab lash here. You'll see every whitewater PFD is gonna have one of these. Climbing in and out of boats regularly is 
I've lost a number of the, the fixed blade knives and stuff like that out there. I found one in the bottom of my raft once from somebody else who climbed in and dropped it in there. So, you know, a, a folder stuck in your front pocket is still going to be quite accessible. And, you know, if you're climbing in and out of the boat a lot, that's prob probably going to be the better way to go. A few other essentials I like to have on out there on the water. Pack a pump from Alpaca. This thing's great. It's going to top off your boat much more easily than any other way. They are so convenient, so effective. You know, the bag does a great job getting the majority of the air in there, but this is so much easier than wrapping your lips around that valve. It's small and it's small and light enough that it's really not a nuisance. Highly recommend that as an accessory. So the bow bags on the alpacas, most of these, all these boats are going to have these little tabs here designed. The bow bag is going to clip on there. It's a super easy and convenient place to store kind of your daily needs. Sunscreen, throw bag, this little pump for topping off at lunch, snacks, that kind of stuff. It's a great way to do it. And it's really well attached on these boats. It's external, so you have good access to it. If you go with a, a small dry bag, you're going to be sticking that like behind your seat or up by your feet. That you can end up tangling around in the air in your stuff, even if it's clipped in swim out of the boat, it's banging around, you're gonna to have to move it again once you're out. Those bow bags are designed specifically for the front of these boats and they do a great job of holding your gear tight and keeping it all together and handy. A couple other little fun things that I like to bring along on trips. This is not the smallest, lightest, or easiest thing to deal with, but out here, especially in the desert southwest, in the springtime, we have a lot of really muddy rivers. These bags from Jack's Plastic Welding, one of my favorites. Take two of them, one or two of these on every trip, scooping water out, letting the sediment settle before you go ahead and try to filter your water. If you're doing trips where you're filtering water, these are kind of essential. And this just really cuts down on just burning through filters. They're also useful for a million other things like collecting firewood and groceries and everything else along the way. Probably one of our best selling items here at the store. Another nice one out there. Everybody likes to have a long camera. Not to mention safety. These days, you know, your phone's practically a satellite SOS beacon. These cases from Cold Case Gear, super simple to use. They keep your phone from getting overly hot, overly cold. So it's helping preserve that battery life. Also really easy in and out closure. Amazingly dry. It's going to float. You've got a place to clip it in. This is a, a great product to bring along with you and keep your phone going for a few days. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this podcast, give us a shout out or a review on Apple Podcast or wherever you found us online. We'll have transcriptions for all our podcasts on our blog at www.fourcornersguides.com. Cheers. <laughs>